Hello, and welcome to Introduction to Nanotechnology. My name is Pete Rayner. I'm an associate professor at the University of Minnesota School of Public Health. The objectives for this module are that, by the end, learners should be able to define nanotechnology and related terms, describe several notable nanomaterials, explain how several notable nanomaterials are used, and illustrate the life cycle of several nanomaterial products. Here is an informal definition for nanotechnology from the late Richard Smalley, who was a professor at Rice University and one of the discoverers of fullerenes, also called buckyballs. Nanotechnology is the art and science of building stuff that does stuff at the nanometer scale. This definition gets to the main point of nanotechnology, that it uses the unique properties of matter at the nanometer scale for useful purposes. An interesting aspect of this definition is that it asserts that nanotechnology requires technical skill, the art of nanotechnology, to go along with understanding of basic and applied sciences. When we talk about nanotechnology, we talk about dimensions much smaller than those we are familiar with. The concept of orders of magnitude is relevant when we consider these dimensions. Orders of magnitude are written as powers of 10, and orders of magnitude differences between dimensions can also be written as powers of 10. Thus, an object that is 10 times bigger than another object is 10 to the first power, or one order of magnitude, larger. Likewise, an object that is 100 times bigger is 10 to the second power, or two orders of magnitude, larger. Looking at some other specific examples, the number 0.001 .001 can be written as 10 to the minus third power. Similarly, 0.1 can be written as 10 to the minus first power, and 0.1 is two orders of magnitude greater than 0.001 because 10 to the minus first power divided by 10 to the minus third power is 10 to the second power. 1 is equal to 10 to the 0 power, so it is one order of magnitude greater than 0.1. 10 to the 0 power divided by 10 to the minus first power is equal to 10 to the first power. And 1 is three orders of magnitude greater than 0.001. In turn, 10 is equal to 10 to the first power, so it's one order of magnitude greater than 1 and four orders of magnitude greater than 0.001. Our last example is 1000, which is 10 to the third power, so it is two orders of magnitude greater than 10 and six orders of magnitude greater than 0.001. Orders of magnitude are important in nanotechnology and the health of products that incorporate nanotechnology because we are talking about dimensions that vary by many powers of 10. When we talk about dimensions that do not differ by an exact power of 10, we can round to the nearest order of magnitude. For instance, if the ratio between two numbers, one divided by the other, is 2.3 times 10 to the fourth power, we say they differ by approximately four orders of magnitude. Quantities with a ratio of 7.9 times 10 to the seventh power differ by about eight orders of magnitude. Another way to look at orders of magnitude is using a website called Scale of the Universe. This site allows us to look at objects at different orders of magnitude relative to one meter, which is the approximate size of human bodies as well as beach balls and giant earthworms. If we go up, one order of magnitude is indicated by the number in the lower right corner. We're at a scale of 10 meters, which is the scale of elephants, giraffes, saguaro cacti, and T-Rexes. Going up two more orders of magnitude to the scale of 10 to the third meters, or one kilometer, we're at the scale of the largest buildings. Going up another three orders of magnitude to... 10 to the 6 meters, or 1,000 kilometers, we're at the scale of states and countries and moons and dwarf planets. With an additional three orders of magnitude, we're at the scale of the sun. Another three orders of magnitude puts us at the scale of the largest red giant stars. At 13 orders of magnitude larger than the human scale, we are encompassing our entire solar system, including the Kuiper Belt. 
From here we can go up many more orders of magnitude until we reach the scale of the observable universe, which is 27 orders of magnitude larger than the human scale. If we return to the human scale, we can reduce our scale by many orders of magnitude. When we go down one order of magnitude from the human scale to the 10 centimeter scale, we're at the scale of hummingbirds, chicken eggs, and matchsticks. Going down two more orders of magnitude to the millimeter scale puts us in the range of ants, sand grains, and the largest bacteria. Red blood cells are roughly five orders of magnitude smaller than the human scale. Reducing our scale another order of magnitude to the micrometer scale, we see that we are at the scale of clay particles, the largest viruses, and the wavelength of visible light. DNA is roughly eight orders of magnitude smaller than humans. Another order of magnitude puts us at the nanometer scale where we see large molecules, the wavelengths of x-rays, and objects created by nanotechnology. If we go smaller and smaller, we get to the scale of protons and neutrons at 15 orders of magnitude smaller than the human scale. Because nanotechnology produces stuff at the nanometer scale, this stuff may interact with parts of the human body, organs, cells, DNA, differently than other things that are small to humans, but because they are at the micrometer or millimeter scale, are many orders of magnitude larger than the stuff created by nanotechnology. We know that one micrometer is one times 10 to the minus sixth meter, and that one nanometer is one times 10 to the minus ninth meter. So there are six orders of magnitude difference between one micrometer and one meter, and nine orders of magnitude difference between one nanometer and one meter. This means that there are three orders of magnitude difference between one nanometer and one micrometer. To put these differences in perspective in one more way, let's imagine that the Empire State Building, which is 1,454 feet tall to its tip, is only 100 micrometers tall. Objects roughly 100 micrometers in size are about the largest objects that can remain airborne long enough to be inhaled into a person's respiratory system. If the Empire State Building is 100 micrometers tall, the Great Pyramid at Giza would be 31 micrometers tall. A tennis court, like Center Court at Wimbledon, would be 5.4 micrometers long. An adult male giraffe would be roughly 1.2 micrometers tall. If the Empire State Building were 100 micrometers tall, LeBron James would be 0.46 micrometer, or 460 nanometers tall. R2-D2 would be 250 nanometers tall. An official FIFA soccer ball would have a diameter of 50 nanometers. A can of Diet Dew, my personal favorite, would be 15 nanometers in diameter at its widest. Finally, an M&M would be 2.3 nanometers in diameter if the Empire State Building were 100 micrometers tall. You can imagine that if someone were to throw a normal-sized M&M at you, it might sting. If it were thrown at you hard enough, it could injure your eye. If your mouth were open when the M&M was thrown, it could get stuck in your windpipe. A child could stick an M&M up his nose. You could eat too many M&Ms in a sitting and make yourself sick, or too many over your lifetime and make yourself fat. These are all potential health effects from exposure to M&Ms. If someone were to throw the real Empire State Building at you, it would do more than sting. You would certainly injure yourself if you tried to eat the Empire State Building, or stick it up your nose. The health effects of exposure to an M&M and the Empire State Building differ mostly due to their orders of magnitude size difference. Therefore, you can imagine that objects that are on the micrometer scale and the nanometer scale may cause different health effects in humans because of their size differences. This is especially the case if they are inhaled. On this diagram, I want to point out the three different regions of the human respiratory system. 
First, there is the nasal pharyngeal laryngeal region, which encompasses the nasal cavity and the oral cavity just beyond the nose and mouth, the pharynx in the back of the throat where the two cavities come together, and the larynx, the voice box, just beyond the epiglottis, the flap that separates the respiratory system from the digestive system. Next is the tracheobronchial region, which encompasses the windpipe or trachea, the branching of the trachea into the two lobes of the lungs, and the additional branching of the airways that is similar to the branches of a tree. Finally, the air sacs at the very end of the branches of the tracheobronchial region, shown in the inset, are the alveoli, or the alveolar region of the lung. This is the part of the lung where gas exchange occurs, oxygen for carbon dioxide. Because these regions of the lung have different dimensions, different processes govern the movement of particles in these regions, and different sizes of particles may reach and deposit in the three regions, causing different health effects. Due to the different dimensions of the various regions of the lung and the potential for exposure to many different sizes of airborne particles, standard setting organizations have developed size selective criteria for sampling aerosol particles that vary by the region of the lung. The criteria were established by consensus among the American Conference of Governmental Industrial Hygienists, the International Organization for Standardization, and the European Committee for Standardization. Many samplers for airborne particles are designed according to these criteria to exclude particles that do not reach the various regions of the respiratory system. The inhalation criterion defines the fraction of particles at each size that can be breathed into the nose or mouth. This fraction is referred to as inhalable particles. The thoracic criterion, a subset of the inhalation criterion, defines the fraction of particles of each size that can reach the tracheobronchial region of the lung and beyond. Then, the respirable criterion, a subset of the thoracic criterion, defines the fraction of particles that can penetrate to the deepest parts of the lungs, the alveolar region. This fraction is referred to as respirable particles. So, the inhalable criterion includes those particles that can penetrate to all parts of the lung, the thoracic criterion includes particles that can penetrate to the tracheobronchial and alveolar regions, and the respirable criterion includes only those particles that can penetrate to the alveolar region. This diagram shows the inhalable sampling criterion graphically. The criterion is an equation for the fraction of particles at each size that can be inhaled. Size on the horizontal axis is defined as the aerodynamic diameter which is the diameter of a spherical particle with a density of water that settles due to gravity at the same velocity as the particle you're interested in. The aerodynamic diameter is shown on a logarithmic scale, which means that each order of magnitude is evenly spaced. The fraction from 0 to 1 is represented on the vertical axis on a linear scale. The blue area represents the particles that are included in the inhalable sampling criterion. The graph shows that about 50% of 100 micrometer diameter particles can be inhaled through the nose or mouth. Almost all particles 1 micrometer and smaller can be inhaled. In this graph, we superimpose the thoracic criterion in green on top of the inhalable criterion. No particles larger than about 30 micrometers in aerodynamic diameter can reach the tracheobronchial region because they cannot enter the respiratory system or they do not make it past the nasal, pharyngeal, laryngeal region. On the other hand, about half of the particles 10 micrometers in diameter and almost all particles 1 micrometer and smaller can reach the tracheobronchial region. The remainder of the inhalable criterion in blue represents those particles that can be inhaled but cannot make it to the tracheobronchial region. Here we have the respirable criterion in red. No particles larger than 10 micrometers can reach the alveolar region because they either cannot be inhaled or they do not pass through the upper regions of the respiratory system. About half of particles 4 micrometers in diameter can penetrate into the deepest part of the lung. Most particles 1 micrometer in diameter and smaller can penetrate into the alveolar region. As before, the blue area on the graph represents those particles that can be inhaled but cannot make it to the tracheobronchial region. The green area represents the particles that can pass to the tracheobronchial region 
but not into the alveolar region. These criteria represent the particles that are in the air that enters each region of the respiratory system. Put another way, these sampling criteria can be used to measure the potential dose for particles in each part of the lung. The criteria do not represent the particles that deposit in the respiratory system, the applied dose, because many of the particles will leave the respiratory system with exhaled air. These sampling criteria are very useful to occupational hygienists, but as the Nobel Prize winning physicist Richard Feynman put it when talking about the possibility of building structures at the atomic and nanometer scale, there's plenty of room at the bottom. How do we think about and categorize particles even smaller than those considered in the sampling criteria, including those at the nanometer scale. In 1998, the aerosol scientist Othmar Prining defined fine particles as those that are one micrometer in aerodynamic diameter and smaller. This is a fairly common definition, although ASTM, formerly the American Society for Testing and Materials, defines fine particles as those 2.5 micrometers and smaller. This figure shows just the equations for the three sampling criteria, the inhalable criterion in blue, the thoracic criterion in green, and the respirable criterion in red. When we look at Prining's fine particle definition against the size selective sampling criteria, we see that fine particles in yellow are among the respirable particles that can penetrate to all regions of the respiratory system. However, fine particles exclude the many particles larger than one micrometer that can penetrate to all parts of the respiratory system, including the alveolar region of the lung. Prining defined ultrafine particles as being those smaller than 0.1 micrometer or 100 nanometers in aerodynamic diameter. This is also a fairly common definition. When we include the ultrafine definition in purple on the same graph as the fine particle and sampling criteria definitions, we see that we are now talking about stuff, using Smalley's word, that are within two orders of magnitude of the nanometer scale. We've talked about a bunch of different size-based definitions of particles. So where do nanoparticles fit in? There are many definitions we should think about related to nanoparticles. Several documents and websites have especially relevant definitions. These include ASTM standard E2456-06, standard terminology relating to nanotechnology from 2012, ISO standard 27687 on nanotechnology terminology and definitions from 2008, a National Institute for Occupational Safety and Health, or NIOSH, publication from 2009 titled Approaches to Safe Nanotechnology, and the website of the National Nanotechnology Initiative, or NNI, nano.gov. As nanotechnology is still an emerging field, we should expect that our definitions will continue to evolve to some extent into the future. Looking at some of the definitions we have already, a definition for nanotechnology from the NNI is that it is the understanding and control of matter at the nanoscale, at dimensions between approximately 1 and 100 nanometers, where unique phenomena enable novel applications. So that seems like a pretty simple definition that gets us into the 1 to 100 nanometer range, which is the same range covered by Prining's definition of ultrafine particles. Unfortunately, there is no one agreed upon definition for nanotechnology. A second definition that comes from the ASTM standard is that nanotechnology is a term referring to a wide range of technologies that measure, manipulate, or incorporate materials and or features with at least one dimension between approximately 1 and 100 nanometers. Such applications exploit the properties, distinct from bulk macroscopic systems, of nanoscale components. Here again, this definition indicates that nanotechnology deals with stuff, using Smalley's word again, in the range of 1 to 100 nanometers, in at least one of the three dimensions. However, this definition is more precise, and you have to read it carefully. It is a little more restrictive than the one from the NNI, because it specifically says that nanotechnology applications exploit properties of materials that are different at the nanoscale 
than on the macroscopic scale. So, to reiterate, there is no single definition for nanotechnology. The ISO standard defines a nano object as a material with one, two, or three external dimensions in the size range from approximately 1 to 100 nanometers. The standard goes further to define a nanoplate as a nano object with one external dimension at the nanoscale. We can think of this as being like a wafer or a flake, something very thin in one dimension but wide and flat in the other two dimensions. A nanofiber is a nano object with two external dimensions at the nanoscale, with nanotubes referring to hollow nanofibers and nanorods referring to solid nanofibers. So nanofibers are long in one dimension while being very thin in the other two dimensions. Nanoparticles, and this is just the definition from the ISO standard, are nano objects with three external dimensions at the nanoscale. This definition for nanoparticles makes them look a lot like ultrafine particles as defined by Prining. We're certainly running through a lot of definitions. Maybe it's starting to fluster us a little bit, but we're not done yet. The ASTM standard gives us an additional definition for nanoparticle, saying that in nanotechnology it is a subclassification of ultrafine particle with links in two or three dimensions greater than 0.001 micrometer or 1 nanometer and smaller than about 0.1 micrometer or 100 nanometers, and which may or may not exhibit a size-related intensive property. So this definition talks about nanoparticles as a subclassification of ultrafine particles. This definition makes us think some more because the previous definition indicated that nanoparticles were between 1 and 100 nanometers in all three dimensions, whereas this one says nanoparticles are those with two or three dimensions between 1 and 100 nanometers. So this definition includes the nanofibers, the nanotubes and nanorods, from the previous definition as nanoparticles. We're still not done with our definitions. NIOSH defines a nanomaterial as a larger matrix or substrate into which nano objects are incorporated. A nano aerosol refers to nano objects suspended in a gas. A nano hydrosol would be nano objects suspended in a liquid. Sometimes this is also referred to as a colloid. Nanocomposites are nano objects embedded in a matrix. Some plastics are now nanocomposites with nano objects being used to provide strength to polymers. Like me, you're probably getting tired of all these definitions, but we're still not done with them. Many people call everything that's smaller than about 100 nanometers a nanomaterial. For instance, some people refer to all ultrafine particles all particles 100 nanometers and smaller, as nanoparticles. However, this is in conflict with the definitions we've seen that indicate that nanomaterials utilize the special properties of nano objects that arise because of their size. The U.S. Environmental Protection Agency, EPA, has offered some definitions to distinguish among different kinds of nanomaterials for those who wish to call everything at the nanoscale a nanomaterial. The EPA suggests that naturally occurring nanomaterials are formed and released into the environment as a result of natural processes such as weathering, erosion, and volcanic eruptions. They consider incidental nanomaterials to include materials that are produced as a byproduct of an intentional anthropogenic process such as industrial processing, laboratory procedures, and combustion. So, for example, many particles produced by smoking tobacco or burning wood in fireplaces would be incidental nanomaterials. EPA uses engineered nanomaterials, which has become a very common term, to describe a wide range of compounds that are intentionally manufactured in a research or commercial setting. They are designed to exhibit specific properties and maintain uniform structures so that they can be used in a wide range of advanced applications. So, engineered nanomaterials are what most of us think about when we think about nanotechnology, materials that are intentionally manipulated for a purpose. However, you should keep in mind that natural materials and byproducts of what people do are sometimes referred to as nanomaterials, especially when we talk about nanoparticles. 
By this point, you're probably getting pretty steamed about all these complicated and overlapping definitions. So let's move on. Next, we're going to talk about some of the important engineered nanomaterials because engineered nanomaterials are what occupational hygienists are thinking about when we talk about nanotechnology health and safety for workers. First, we'll discuss nanosilver. We'll then talk about carbon nanotubes, nanotitanium dioxide, and other nanoceramics. We'll talk a little bit about nanoclays and then finish up with some discussion about quantum dots. Let's get started with nanosilver and how it is produced. Colloids are suspensions in which insoluble particles like silver are stably dispersed in another substance, and this usually refers to solid particles dispersed in a liquid. Silver colloids have been produced industrially since the 1800s. Citrate stabilized silver colloids were first reported in 1889. Stabilization of nanosilver formulations with proteins was reported as early as 1902. Modern production of silver colloids using these same techniques suggests that the average diameters of the silver particles were likely 10 nanometers or smaller. So these nanomaterials were in use a long time ago, even if the producers didn't know they were using nanomaterials. A variety of chemical and electrochemical processes are used to synthesize nanosilver in colloidal form today, and physical processes such as laser ablation can produce silver dispersions, often with greater purity than the older chemical processes can. Why have people produced nanosilver for so long, and why are we interested in it? Well, silver ions have biocidal properties, in other words, the ability to kill microorganisms. This diagram from Novak and co-authors shows the relative amount of silver ion released on the horizontal axis versus the amount of silver contained in products for a variety of forms of silver on the vertical axis. The ability of a silver-containing product to release silver ions is critical for biocidal applications. If silver salts are able to dissolve in water, they will release high quantities of silver ions. Silver sulfide on the left of the diagram is insoluble in water, so it is not a good biocide. To the right, silver nitrate is highly soluble in water, so much so that it can be a poor biocide because it will disappear from a product too quickly. Materials that store silver in a matrix such as silver zeolite, silver zirconium phosphate, and silver glass have a high potential to release silver ions, but you need a relatively large amount of silver in the product. Silver chloride salt has a lower potential to release silver ions, but you don't need very much of it in a product. Silver metal releases fewer silver ions than silver chloride, but the amount of release depends significantly on the size of the silver metal, with nanosilver having a much better potential to release ions than larger microscale or bulk silver because it has more surface area per unit mass. So, nanosilver releases a significant amount of silver ion for biocidal purposes without needing a lot of silver in the material in which it is embedded. In addition, nanosilver can be applied to a variety of products as a stable coating. Applications for nanosilver include being used as a biocidal additive in textiles. It has been used in socks with the idea that it will kill bacteria that cause foot odor. It's also been used in athletic clothing bedding, and stuffed animals. Nanosilver has also been used in plastics such as medical supplies and equipment and food packaging. It's been used in water filters impregnated into activated carbon and ceramic materials. It's been used in drinking water and swimming pool filters too. In addition, it has been included in algicide and disinfectant liquids, including those used in swimming pools, and even in sprays that have been applied in public spaces. In 2006, the Hong Kong subway system sprayed many of the surfaces and handrails on subway platforms and cars with a nanosilver-containing spray in hopes of killing influenza viruses and other germs. The image on the left shows nanosilver particles coated onto a fiber used in medical dressings. So you have consumer products like the one pictured that use nanosilver in adhesive bandages to hopefully reduce the risk of infection of a wound. Other products include fabrics like the one pictured here with silver nanoparticles on them. I mentioned socks that contain nanosilver previously. 
This is a picture of a worker spraying surfaces on one of the cars in the Hong Kong subway system to hopefully decontaminate them and provide long-term protection against viruses and other germs. Let's talk next about carbon nanotubes. There are two main types of carbon nanotubes, single-walled carbon nanotubes and multi-walled carbon nanotubes. Depending on your definition, individual nanotubes can be referred to as a nanofiber or a nanoparticle. Single-walled carbon nanotubes typically have diameters ranging from half of a nanometer up to two nanometers, and their lengths are usually greater than one micrometer. Multi-walled carbon nanotubes, as shown in the diagram, are nanofibers with tubes inside of tubes inside of tubes. You can have multi-walled nanotubes with many more than the three tubes depicted here. For multi-walled carbon nanotubes, diameters can range from 2 to more than 100 nanometers, and lengths can be greater than 10 micrometers. These photos show a transmission electron microscope, or TEM, image of individual single-walled carbon nanotubes on the left, and a scanning electron microscope, or SEM, image on the right that shows how single-walled carbon nanotubes are often grown as a lawn or forest of nanotubes. This photo shows a TEM image of a thin slice across the diameter of a multi-walled carbon nanotube. You can see that there are a total of nine walls in this nanotube. To me, they look a little like tree rings. There are a number of different ways in which carbon nanotubes can be created. This YouTube video created by Women in Nano in 2008 shows several of the ways that they could be created in laboratories. Let's take a look. I told you that carbon nanotubes are not synthesized as a graphite sheet that rolls up, so how are they made? The mechanism is still not fully understood, but in this video I will show you the setup for the main different techniques used by scientists to produce carbon nanotubes. There are two main techniques. The first one to be used was arc discharge. This is the chamber for the arc discharge which is filled with an unreactive gas. Inside two rods of graphite will be placed and we will apply a current. One of the rods will be the anode and the other will be the cathode. When the two rods are brought together and the current is applied a spark is produced between the rods which instantly vaporizes the tip of one of the rods and this carbon gas forms the nanotubes. Black soot is produced and starts to cover the whole chamber including the window so after a while we can't see anything anymore. When we open the chamber we can see how the anode is being consumed and the black powder is deposited everywhere around. On the cathode there is also black powder where we will find carbon nanotubes normally with 20 to 30 walls although if we also include a metal catalyst in the anode we can obtain single walled nanotubes. The nanotubes made with this technique are quite perfect free of defects but the problem is that there are another bunch of carbon forms that are also produced so then it is very difficult to separate them. It's also hard to make a lot this way. The other main technique is chemical vapor deposition, but it is most commonly known by its abbreviation, CVD. In this case, the starting material is not graphite, but some carbon-based gas, a hydrocarbon. We also need a metal catalyst to form tiny particles which will act like seeds. In this CVD machine at Oxford University, the metal is included in the starting molecules. They use ferrocene, which contains one iron atom per molecule. The young scientist takes a clean tube and sets up the experiment. He introduces a clean base in the tube and closes all empty space with heat resistant cotton to keep the heating. An unreactive gas is passed through the heated solution of the hydrocarbon. The mixture passes through the furnace where the temperature can be from 300 up to 1150 degrees C. He can run the experiment for as little as 5 minutes up to hours in order to get longer tubes. Once the experiment is finished he collects nanotubes from the soot stuck on the tube sides and also the base, previously clean, which now has nanotubes all over it. CVD is probably the most promising method to produce carbon nanotubes for industrial use. It is easy to introduce other elements such as boron or nitrogen in the starting chemical. The diameter of the tubes can be chosen by the size of the metal catalyst particles. Also we can grow the tubes on the surface, which helps for future applications. Arc discharge and CVD are the most common techniques, but there are others, like laser ablation, in this technique, a laser is used to vaporize the carbon atoms from a graphite target. Laser ablation normally produces single-walled nanotubes. Another less common technique is electrolysis. This technique is in some ways similar to the arc discharge because it also uses two graphite electrodes. 
but in this case the electrodes are immersed in molten ionic salts. With this technique only multi-walled nanotubes are produced. They have very few walls, 10 to 15, and are normally bundled together. As you can see there are different techniques to produce carbon nanotubes, and each technique produces nanotubes of different qualities. Other than the narrator animation being a little goofy, that was a good video to show the basics of how carbon nanotubes are produced. To summarize, the different carbon nanotube production methods include arc discharge, where a direct current discharge between two graphite electrodes, an anode and a cathode, at temperatures above 1700 degrees C, produces multi-walled carbon nanotubes with few structural defects relative to the other methods. Although, as they pointed out on the video, purification is needed to remove other forms of carbon. Laser ablation uses a laser directed at a graphite pellet that may contain catalysts such as nickel or cobalt at high temperatures. This produces single-walled carbon nanotubes with relatively high quality and purity. CVD, or chemical vapor deposition, is considered the standard method now for carbon nanotube production. A catalyst, such as iron, nickel, or cobalt, decomposes a hydrocarbon gas using heat or plasma radiation at temperatures typically less than 800 degrees C. The hydrocarbon gas can be methane, ethane, ethylene, acetylene, xylene, isobutane, or ethanol. This relatively low temperature that is used is one reason why CVD has become a favored method on a production scale. The carbon nanotubes grow on substrates and precise control of nanotube orientation, alignment, diameter, length, purity, and density are possible. With all of these methods, purification of the product is required. That is one of the main challenges for producing carbon nanotubes industrially for wider scale use. Single wall carbon nanotubes produced by chemical vapor deposition often grow like a lawn or a forest. These images from Hata and co-authors show these nanotubes when viewed at different dimensional orders of magnitude. We go from image A, where we see the complete lawn or forest, through images B and then C, where we see the lawn at a micrometer scale, through image D, where we see the nanotubes on a 100 nanometer scale, and finally at the nanometer scale in image E. These photos show how single-walled carbon nanotubes can be produced in large quantities for use. Why do we want to produce carbon nanotubes? Why are they useful? As shown in this diagram, one reason is because they can carry a lot of electrical current. They can carry more current than copper by three orders of magnitude. Young's modulus measures the ability of a material to keep its shape and avoid stretching when a force is applied. The Young's modulus for carbon nanotubes is nearly as high as for diamond, which is extremely strong. Tensile strength measures the force required to pull something to the point where it breaks. Tests show that carbon nanotubes are stronger than Kevlar. In addition, they are nearly as thermally conductive as aluminum. Clearly, carbon nanotubes have many useful properties that can be applied to products now and in the future. One hypothesized application that caught people's imaginations a few years ago was to use carbon nanotubes to produce a space elevator that might be a cheaper and more reliable way to get satellites and other objects into orbit than by launching rockets into space. The nanotubes might work well because of their high Young's modulus and tensile strength. Other potential applications for carbon nanotubes include electronics, like this example of memory technology that is fast, has high storage density, and can be permanent. Carbon nanotubes can be used to increase the capacity and charging speed of lithium ion batteries. They have the potential to be used in supercapacitors for better energy storage and to produce lower cost solar cells. Carbon nanotubes are used to form polymer nanocomposites. The nanotubes offer greater strength and electrical and thermal conductivity to these materials. Existing applications include sporting goods such as tennis rackets and golf clubs. Carbon nanotubes have been used in coatings such as 
anti-fouling coatings applied to the hulls of ships to prevent marine organisms from latching on. They can be used in inks and in biosensors due to their ability to detect a broad range of biological molecules. Pharmaceutical and biomedical devices are another potential application for carbon nanotubes, including in applications such as bone grafting, tissue repair, drug delivery, and diagnostics. However, applications in actual products are being rolled out slowly, mainly because of the challenges to producing carbon nanotubes in large quantities with enough purity in a reliable fashion. Nanotitanium dioxide is produced in interesting ways. There are two different types of titanium that are mined, the minerals rutile and ilmenite. Rutile ore contains the most stable form of titanium dioxide. Ilmenite, which also contains iron, is further processed to produce a synthetic rutile. One place where rutile is mined is in the African nation of Sierra Leone, where it is mined out of a lake. A dredge brings the ore up out of the lake bed, beginning a process where the ore is purified. The ilmenite is typically mined in more traditional surface mines like this one in Norway. Nanotitanium dioxide can be produced from either rutile or synthetic rutile, most often by what is referred to as the chloride process. This process, sketched in the diagram, has been used for many years to produce not just nano-TiO2, but also larger scale TiO2. At high temperature, unpurified rutile or synthetic rutile feedstock is reduced chemically to titanium using a carbon feedstock such as coke. As part of the same step, titanium is oxidized chemically to titanium tetrachloride with a chlorine feedstock. The titanium tetrachloride is condensed and purified to remove contaminants that are a result of the unpurified feedstocks. Then, the titanium tetrachloride reacts with oxygen in a plasma stream to produce highly purified crystalline titanium dioxide. Post-treatment may include milling and surface coating for particular functions. Different companies have their forms of the chloride process. It is generally difficult to get information on these company-specific processes because the companies consider their processes to be proprietary. To produce amorphous nano-TiO2 for specialty purposes, the sol gel process is often used, where pure titanium tetrachloride, or a similar feed compound containing titanium, is reacted in a burner with air and hydrogen to form titanium dioxide. The result of this reaction is a sol in which nano-TiO2 particles are dispersed in a continuous liquid phase. This amorphous sol material can then be used to produce a variety of specialty materials including aerogels, molded objects, fibers, layers of titanium dioxide, and highly pure titanium dioxide nanoparticles. This is an image of titanium dioxide nanoparticles. You can see that, rather than being very round, they are crystalline in form. They are often on the order of 20 to 30 nanometers in size as individual particles. Why do we care about nano-TiO2? What is its value? Perhaps the most important property of nano-TiO2 is its ability to scatter and absorb visible light and ultraviolet radiation. On the horizontal axis on this figure created by Schilling and co-authors, we have the wavelength of light and ultraviolet radiation. Visible light occupies the wavelengths from about 400 to 700 nanometers. Ultraviolet radiation, or UV, which occupies the wavelengths of electromagnetic radiation below visible light down to about 180 nanometers, can be highly damaging to skin cells, potentially causing malignant cancers. On the vertical axis, we have extinction coefficient, which measures the ability of a solid suspended in a gas or a liquid to prevent electromagnetic radiation, like light or UV, from being transmitted through the gas or liquid. The figure includes curves for four different sizes of titanium dioxide nanoparticles. In purple, we have 220 nanometer diameter particles, which have a maximum extinction coefficient at around 440 nanometers, which is in the visible light wavelengths. As we go to smaller and smaller particles, we get better and better extinction at smaller wavelengths in the UV range. This becomes important in sunscreens and cosmetics 
because manufacturers would like to have as much absorption and scattering of ultraviolet radiation as possible without having a lot of scattering of visible light. Scattering in the visible range means that you will see the sun blocking materials. Instead, manufacturers would like the materials to be invisible to the human eye. Titanium dioxide nanoparticles can do this. They absorb and scatter a lot of radiation in the ultraviolet range without showing that they are there. So applications for nano TiO2 include as ultraviolet filters in sunscreens and cosmetics and in plastics and clothing. Nano TiO2 is used as a photocatalyst in products such as self-cleaning coatings like in this image where a nano titanium dioxide coating was applied to the middle block on the wall. As weathering occurred over a number of years, it became evident that the block to which the nano TiO2 was applied was cleaner than the surrounding ones. Other photocatalyst applications for nano TiO2 include cleaning products, electronic products, air purifiers, and in environmental remediation. In some hairstyling devices, like the dryer shown in this image, Titanium dioxide nanoparticles are supposed to produce ions that strengthen and prevent chemical buildup on hair. Nano TiO2 is also being used in photovoltaic cells. There are a number of other nanoceramics in addition to titanium dioxide. Alumina, aluminum oxide, is used as a propellant and in drinking water treatment. Iron oxides are used in magnetic storage technology, catalysts, sensors, and MRI, magnetic resonance imaging. Like titanium dioxide, nano zinc oxide is used a lot in sunscreens. Nano zirconia is used for thermal barrier materials and oxygen sensors. Vanadium oxide nanoscale films are used in smart windows that can react to environmental temperatures to reduce the transmission of infrared radiation from sunlight that makes buildings too hot. When the sun goes away, the windows change to allow more light in. Nano cerium oxide is used as a polishing agent for glass, television tubes, and precision optics as a glass constituent to prevent solarization and discolorization of the glass, in emission control systems in automobile engines, and as a fuel-borne catalyst in diesel to reduce particulate emissions. This last use has raised concerns about direct emission of cerium oxide nanoparticles to the ambient environment. Antimony oxide is used as a flame retardant in applications where high electrical conductivity is required and as an opacifying agent that reduces and controls the amount of light passing through a material. The mixture indium tin oxide, or ITO, has been used in displays in solar cells and in transparent electrically conductive coatings. Another mixture, nanobarium titanate, is used in capacitors and as a flame retardant. It should be clear that there are many different ceramic nanomaterials and many different applications. More nanoceramics and nanoceramic material applications are being developed. Nanoclays are nanoplates of layered mineral silicates, often with only one dimension in the nanoscale. There are several different classes of nanoclays, with montmorillonite nanoclay being the most common, but there's also bentonite, kaolinite, hectorite, and helicite. Individual montmorillonite nanoclay platelets are usually on the order of about 1 nanometer thick, with surfaces of about 300 to greater than 600 nanometers in the other two dimensions. Nanoclays are used to form nanocomposite plastics. They are useful because producers can achieve equivalent strength with less nanoclay versus traditional additives used to strengthen plastics. This makes the plastics weigh less. They provide plastics with better barrier, flame resistance, and thermal properties without a loss of clarity relative to other materials used to strengthen plastics. These nanocomposite plastics have been used in automobile components and food packaging. Their use in automobile components arises because they yield lighter weight plastics that can improve fuel efficiency without sacrificing strength. Other uses include slowing movement of water through soil and rocks. Nanoclays are used as drilling muds for oil and natural gas exploration and extraction. They're used as an absorbent to purify and decolor liquids. 
They can also be used as a filler in paper and rubber and as a base for cosmetics and medicines. Nanoclays are incorporated into polymers first by suspending nanoclay powders in water to separate the nanoclay platelets. Before being incorporated into a polymer, the nanoclay surfaces need to be modified with a surfactant to make them organophilic so that they can be dispersed into the polymer melt. The image on the right shows the nanoclay particles in a nanocomposite plastic. We can see the long and thin dimensions of the nanoplates through the plastic. The nanoclay particles align as the plastics are extruded from the melt. The last nanomaterials we'll look at are quantum dots. These are nanomaterials made from semiconductor materials. When electrons in these nanocrystals are excited, meaning that some energy source causes the electrons to leave their normal orbitals, they are confined by the unusually small dimensions of the nanocrystal. This is very different from the situation in the bulk semiconductor materials. The electronic characteristics of these quantum dots vary with the size and shape of the nanocrystal. Quantum dots can be made from a variety of materials including lead sulfide, lead selenoid, cadmium selenide, cadmium sulfide, indium arsenide, indium phosphide, and many others. These are images of cadmium selenide quantum dots made by Kadavinich. Individual dots are shown in the image on the left. We can see that each dot is only a little larger than 5 nanometers in diameter. On the right, we have a close-up of a single quantum dot in which we can see the individual atoms lined up. One of the reasons that quantum dots are useful is that when they are irradiated with electromagnetic radiation like the ultraviolet radiation used in this image, they fluoresce at different wavelengths, in other words in different colors, depending on their size. How can this be useful? Well, this property can be used as a detection and diagnostic tool in medical applications. The image on the right from Gao and Nye shows a mouse with a tumor to which quantum dots have been attached biochemically. When the mouse is exposed to UV radiation, the quantum dots fluoresce, showing the location of the tumor. Quantum dots can be synthesized as colloids, much like we talked about with nanosilver. Uniform mixtures of precursor chemicals, organic surfactants, and solvents are required for this process. In addition, precise, uniform, and steady high temperatures are required for the reactions. At a manufacturing scale, this process is called high temperature dual injection. The process is scalable, but larger batches lead to spatially varying temperatures that make the product less uniform. A more common production method now is known as molecular seeding, where quantum dots grow on molecular cluster compounds, or seeds. In this method, high temperatures are not needed to initiate the growth of the quantum dots. Instead, the seeds are where the quantum dots grow, and the dots are produced with better uniformity and at higher volumes relative to colloidal synthesis. Electrochemical techniques and CVD can be used to create arrays of quantum dots on substrates. Applications for quantum dots include medical imaging, disease detection, light-emitting diodes, solar cells, photodetector devices, and solid-state quantum computation. Let's talk a little about the life cycles of nanomaterials. This drawing from Sun and co-authors shows different steps in the life cycle. The first step is production of the engineered nanomaterials. At this point in the life cycle, there is potential for worker exposures to hazards as the workers handle the precursors or the nanomaterial product. Next, manufacturers fabricate nanomaterial-enabled products that contain engineered nanomaterials. Again, workers face potential exposures to engineered nanomaterials as they handle incoming nanomaterials, during production processes, and during maintenance and cleanup. The nanomaterial-enabled products are then used by customers and other businesses. Depending on how they're manipulated, there is potential for human exposure to nanomaterials being released from these products. At the end of their use, the nanomaterials and the nanomaterial-enabled products are hopefully not released directly to the ambient environment, called the ecosphere in the diagram. Preferably, they will be handled through a waste system, referred to as the technosphere in the diagram. Some of the nanomaterials may be in wastewater and will be treated in sewage treatment plants. 
Some may be incinerated, some may be landfilled, some may be recycled. There are opportunities for worker exposures in each of these waste treatment processes. There are also opportunities for the nanomaterials to escape into the ambient environment. Ultimately, some of these materials will find their way into the ecosphere, into the air, soil, or water, or the sediments below surface waters. So, trying to understand where nanomaterials go is an important research endeavor at this point and will help us understand how people are exposed to these materials better than we currently do. Some researchers have started to consider life cycle pathways for specific nanomaterials. This diagram and the one on the next slide come from Novak and co-authors. These authors have sketched out fate and transformation pathways for nano TiO2 used in sunscreens and in paints. These nanomaterials may be released unaltered directly into the ambient environment if the paint or sunscreen is spilled. Alternatively, they may be released freely after use. Nano TiO2 in sunscreens is released rapidly when users swim. From painted surfaces, nano TiO2 is released slowly as the paint ages and weathers. The nano TiO2 may enter the wastewater stream when sunscreen users take a shower or when painters clean their brushes. Unused products may be discarded and enter landfills. Ultimately, some portion of the nano TiO2 will end up in the ecosphere. At each step along the way and upstream from this diagram as the nanomaterials and nanomaterial enabled products are produced, there is a potential for human exposure. A similar analysis can be performed for carbon nanotubes in a nanocomposite plastic. When the plastic reaches the end of its useful life, it may be sent to a landfill or it may be incinerated. However, in many cases, plastics are intentionally manipulated or they wear as they age, either of which could release the engineered nanomaterial freely. This released nanomaterial could find its way into wastewater and be treated there, or more likely, it will end up in the ecosphere. Again, at any step in this process, or as the engineered nanomaterial is produced, people may be exposed, and this exposure has some potential to cause a health effect. To summarize the main points of this module, orders of magnitude are factors of 10 that help us think about the relative dimensions of materials. Nanotechnology refers to the measurement, manipulation, and incorporation of materials with at least one dimension between approximately 1 and 100 nanometers. Many types of nanomaterials exist, each with its own unique properties and uses. For many nanomaterials, turning unique features into products is a challenge. There is still a lot of research to be done on the properties and uses of nanomaterials in both industry and academia. This presents many opportunities for worker exposures in research laboratories, as well as in larger scale product development and production processes. Related to this, finally, life cycle analyses suggest that human exposures are possible throughout a nanoproduct's life cycle. While we will focus on worker health most often when we talk about nanotechnology health and safety, we must keep in mind that there are more and more opportunities for the public to be exposed to engineered nanomaterials. This lesson has been created by the Midwest Emerging Technologies Public Health and Safety Training, or METFAST program, a collaboration of the University of Minnesota School of Public Health, the University of Iowa College of Public Health, and Dakota County Technical College. Funding for the METFAST program is provided by the National Institute of Environmental Health Sciences. The content of this lesson is solely the responsibility of the developers and does not necessarily represent the official views of the National Institutes of Health. Thank you for joining me.